Julia um, Guerrero, also a researcher at SESH, uh, working specifically on sexual violence, masculinities, feminisms, nationalisms, migrations. I like the way uh, you pluralize these and how they are represented in literature and media, especially. She has uh, numerous articles and published two books as a single author. Uh, recently started a radio, radio program for uh, disseminating academic knowledge on these topics. Uh, and we are very proud of, of her work, especially when she became part of the independent commission that investigated sexual abuse of children uh, by the Portuguese Catholic Church. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Beruk and Tomit for their inspiring work. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, Irina, for the presentation and Marisa and Irina for their invitation to be here in this workshop. Like Silvia, I was very happy. I was extremely happy when I received the invitation, but also quite anxious about what am I going to do there? What am I going to say? Um, as I was reading the chapter, Narratives of Resistance from Indefinite Detention Manus Prison Theory and Error in Prison Exiles Collective, uh, namely the part uh, where you develop the concept of a curiacal system to refer to this interconnected social system built around discrimination, uh, uh, domination, oppression, and submission. I realized that to a certain extent, my work on sexual violence has been uh, to examine the role of rape as a discourse in that uh, system, in this curiacal system. Uh, and I was thinking about my work when I when I research on the cultural memories of the rape of German women in World War II, uh, rape stories in Western media coverage of the war in Libya, the sexual assaults in Cologne in 2016, and more recently about rape stories involving celebrities in the aftermath of Me Too. Uh, I have never actually focused the aggressors nor the victims or survivors but my focus, uh, the focus of my work has always been on society or how society has responded to testimonies of rape, what society has done with individuals uh, and shared memories of sexual violence, and also how, how rape stories have been co-opted in systems of domination. In her study about sexual violence in American literature and culture, Sabina Zilka argues that every discourse of rape has, and I'm quoting, its history, its ideology, and its dominant narratives. And she also writes that to talk, and I'm quoting again, to talk about rape does not necessarily denote rape, because when rape is transposed into discourse, it turns into a rhetorical device an insistent figure for other social, political, and economic concerns and conflicts. So this brings us to the question, which, and I think she's quite poignant in this, uh, in these sentences, and this brings us to the question, so which are the concerns and conflicts that are articulated in contemporary discourses about rape? Uh, we know that mainstream ma media pays much attention to sexual violence. Uh, sexual violence has become a commodity that gets more clicks. So news about sexual violence, they get more clicks, they sell news. It's a way of mm -hmm. selling news. Uh, we also know that traditionally there's a broad research on that. Uh, traditionally, rapists tended to be identified, mm -hmm. whether in the press or in our imaginaries, in our shared imaginaries, rapists tended to be identified with the other. So they were the enemy in war, in war propaganda, it was always the enemy uh, who raped. Uh, and in formal peace, so with groups from the margins of society, so marginals, unemployed men, and so on. Uh, stories of rape involving men from our so-called imagined community uh, used to have media attention, much media attention, especially in the yellow press, but only as long as their stories involve particularly gruesome details and crimes that could be commodified as a spectacle of horrors. So I'm thinking about serial killers, as a citizen, pedophiles like the, the Belgium Marc Dutru, or stories involving incest and sexual slavery, like the case of the Austrian uh, Josef Fritz, and the one who kidnapped his daughter for, mm -hmm. for a decade. 
Uh, so these men who were part of the imagined community, they were singled out as monsters and uh, they were perceived as being part of the racially and ethnically constructive imagined community. But at the same time, they were mediated and perceived as not representing that imagined community. So on the contrary, they were the exception in that community and they were the exception among us and therefore all this horror uh, about reading about their, their deeds. Uh, this contrasts with rape stories involving aggressors with an ethnic and racial background associated with otherness. And I'm thinking here, for example, about the racialized man in the, in, in the case of uh, child sexual abuse scandals, which took place in Rotherham, UK during the 90s. So media tended to frame this man as representing a collective, the collective being immigrants, Muslims, and so on. This constructed in this, the opposite of the monster rape is like uh, Fritz or the truth in Belgium. So as uh, anthropologist Miriam Tiktim uh, argued, in our contemporary multicultural Western societies, sexual violence has become often a language of border control and exclusion used to define who belongs and who is not part of our so-called values, civilizations, and society. Colonial legacies regarding colonized men as potential sexual aggressors and threats to the sexual safety of white women resonate in these discourses. The sexual assaults in Cologne in Germany in 2016 are emblematic of this framing. There is a significant body of research about the co-option of feminist agendas against sexual violence by Islamophobic and anti-immigration political actors and Cologne is one of the most exa emblematic examples. However, resisting, so we know we have a lot of research on this co-option, but how to resist and how to to make a change that remains a challenge and remains difficult. Uh, on one hand, because resisting the racialization and othering of sexual violence remains a challenge. First of all, because of the commercial value of news about rape as titillating commodities that reaffirm our entrenched social phobias. But also, I mean, this is on one side why it is so difficult to, to resist. On the, other, on the other side, because of the complexity and the blind spots of making sexual violence visible. Uh, I'm going now to the sexual assaults in Cologne. When discussing the sexual assaults of Cologne, German feminists were caught in these entanglements. Some of them embraced the racialized narrative about sexual violence as being an import to Germany's re-immigration and drew parallels between these, the assaults in Cologne and situations of sexual violence in public spaces in cities like Cairo, Egypt. Others, like the collective Ausnahmslos, reframed the discussion as a German event and used sexual assaults in German festivities like the Oktoberfest in Munich as the point of rest, reference to discuss Cologne. So say, like, this is a German problem, we have it with white German men as well. Others, and I find this their uh, contribution particularly interesting. Uh, uh, the collective women uh, in exile, women in, in, in exile is, uh, is a collective of women with an immigration background. They had very strong words against the instrumentalization of the sexual assaults to tighten the surveillance and deportation of immigrants. Uh, this collective uh, had been la long campaigning, campaigning against sexual violence and harassment at German asylum facilities. So uh, by refugee men and by German personnel. Women in exile argued that the only ethical response to Cologne was to synthesize, to synthesize with sexually abused refugee women the way the German public had synthesized with the women in Cologne. This required, first of all, the abolishment of asylum camps that at that time in Germany in 2016 were overcrowded facilities where situation of coercion, harassment and sexual violence could easily happen. So they said the first thing you have to demand the abolishment of asylum seek, seek, uh, camps and you have to work for the accommodation of asylum seekers in flats in Sweden. 
there were also contributions from abroad, which signaled the urgency and the difficulties in developing transnational alliances. Two months after the sexual assaults in Cologne, the Egyptian feminist organization, Nazra for Feminist Studies, issued a statement about the incidents because, and I'm quoting them, feminist solidarity is a universal concept that transcends borders. Nazra's statement was an attempt to engage what they called Western feminists in a transnational discussion about the entanglements of violence against women, culture, religion, racism, and immigration. Nazra linked the, the assaults in Cologne to the silence background in North African countries. And this is something that is quite demanding, problematic, because this, this was exactly what the anti-immigration voices were doing at the time in Germany. So connecting Cologne to Cairo. And they did it as well, of course, in with a different purpose, but they did it as well. So uh, Nazra, Nazra did it because it used, it was also a way of using this opportunity to expose mis misogynist practices in Egypt, in Egypt to an international audience. Nazra voiced discomfort at what it experienced as Western feminist tendency to downplay the anti-patriarchy struggles of feminists in Arab countries for fear of being called Islamophobic and urged this Western feminists, what they called Western feminists, to support Arab women, not only against dictatorship and imperialism, but also against, and I'm quoting, extremist values and fundamentalist ideas. However, as Nadia Alali wrote in her wonderful article entitled Sexual Violence in Iraq, Challenges for Transnational Feminist Politics, and I'm quoting now Nadia Alali, articulating a coherent transnational feminist solidarity, and the quote, remains a very complicated urgency when it involves situations like the sexual uh, assaults, uh, sexual violence, and I'm, uh, th this is the, the topic of uh, Nadia Lali uh, paper, article, uh, so sexual violence perpetrated by Saddam Hussein's forces and ISIS, uh, which were, as we know, widely instrumentalized in, in the West uh, and, uh, by the US, namely, and uh, its allies. Uh, so it remains very complicated when we are talking about situations like this, given the way feminism has been co-opted ju to justify wars in the Middle East and to discuss migration and border control. However, only the regular cooperation between feminists and the promotion only uh, uh, of transnational anti-rapes initiatives can bring us further in deconstructing this the racialization of sexual violence that we see in Western countries. The risks of appropriation and dangerous convergences like we saw with Nazra are better addressed through creating space to discuss the needs of women in different geographies from different ethnic religious backgrounds and with diversified political priorities and abilities, so to say, we have to engage with organizations like NASRA, even though when they are translated to the West, it is very difficult for us to deal with. So that's, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.